is yours. All right, thank you, Zach. And thank you everybody for being on here today. Um, just, yeah, I know some people are here uh, really concerned about getting their I ISA CEU. So the way we are managing that process now, um, in the chat feature of this, there is a link that Kara has shared and you have to copy that link, paste it into your web browser, and it'll pull up a Google Sheet. It's like an attendance sheet. It'll look like a, an Excel file. And so type your information into there, and that is how we are uh, gathering the pertinent information for obtaining the ISA credit. So please do that. Uh, that way we don't have any problems getting your credits. I'm submitting these through the ISA's post-approval process. Takes like four to six weeks to get that information through. So uh, just so you know, that's, that's uh, the, the way we're doing it. Okay, today's topic, diagnosing, diagnosing and managing abiotic disorders. Uh, Zach mentioned, I'm your host. My name is Emmett Minnick. I am the South Central Technical Manager. I live in the Dallas area but I cover uh, Texas, New Mexico, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Kansas, and Missouri. Uh, so I have a pretty diverse, call it the South Central Territory, a pretty diverse uh, amount of trees and problems that are encountered. Uh, this is a, a presentation that I've been working on uh, for a while, and it's an idea that I had a long time ago, and it kind of all just came through fruition. It's a really cool presentation I have a lot of photographs in here that I've gathered over the years and also photos that have been sent to me from, from customers and, and people uh, throughout my territory. I wanted to make a presentation that is practical for the attendees or the people that are watching the recording. Uh, there's information in here that you can take straight out of this presentation and apply to your business or to your operation if you're a municipality or uh, uh, university or whatever, uh, somebody managing trees, you can take this info, apply it, and hopefully uh, improve the way you're doing some of your diagnosing and the way you're managing some of these things we're going to talk about. So a little bit about myself. I'm going to keep it kind of quick because I have a lot of uh, information in here today. I've been with Arborjet for six years. Uh, started back in 2014. Prior to that, I was the plant healthcare manager for a Dallas area tree care company. Um, I had technician duties myself, but I also did a lot of the kind of tree work type stuff, grinding stumps, a little bit of climbing, sales, diagnosis, uh, you name it, I kind of did it. I became a certified arborist back in 2011, and at the end of 2017, I achieved the designation of board certified master arborist. So, like a lot of you on here today, I'm just a, a big tree nerd. Uh, I love what I do. I love working in tr with trees. Uh, my background is in uh, agronomy and crop science. And so really geared towards uh, growing things, plant and soil sciences. And so I think that's why I have, uh, I really enjoyed this topic of abiotic uh, problems. It really goes back to my roots and what I studied in college. So. Those of you that have been a certified arborist for a while, hopefully you get the, uh, the ISA News Magazine. There is a series called Detective Dendro. You can look these up. Really, really cool stuff that the ISA puts out uh, about diagnosing. And it's real, real stuff that, this, uh, that these consulting arborists ha have encountered in their time. But whenever you're diagnosing a tree, you need to have a process. And oftentimes what I find with folks, uh, especially people that are new to tree care or new to the industry, is they just, they don't have a process. They see a sick tree or somebody asks them, what is this, what's wrong with my tree? And it's overwhelming. You know, it's just like, there's so many things to consider. And the way to go about it is to have a process. And so the first thing is to identify the plant. And then kind of sub, 
sub features of knowing the plant is knowing that plant's characteristics and its favorable growing conditions. So uh, in most urban environments, there are lots of species that are planted that may not be native to that area. That is vital information to know because that is a plant out of place and that in itself can cause lots of problems uh, down the road. And then also uh, what you'll begin to figure out with experience is figuring out the common problems that those species have. Uh, you'll know what to look for. You know, I'm very comfortable in Texas diagnosing trees and very familiar with the trees here because I've been doing uh, tree work here and, and plant health care for the better part of 10 years. And so there's not a whole lot of things in my uh, local vicinity that I haven't seen before. And so just becoming familiar with things really helps a lot. So identify the plant. Next is to determine if a problem exists. And to do that, you need to examine and list out the signs and symptoms. Is there a pattern to these symptoms? Look at the bud scars, and that's where you can see the annual tip growth. You can count those bud scars back. And actually, one of the photos that I have in here later, I can, I can highlight what a bud scar is, if you may not know what that is. You want to evaluate the site. And this is really where uh, the detective work comes in. Where I always start is checking out the root flare of the tree that's in question. In my experience, most plant problems are, a, are related to how that tree was planted. In the Dallas-Fort Worth area, most of the trees are planted. Uh, this area used to be grasslands until it was developed by people. And so really a lot of the urban and, you know, uh, in the suburbs, those are all planted trees. And so a lot of times you can expose the root flare and you'll find all kinds of goofy stuff underneath there that was done incorrectly. And that's ultimately what's led the tree into decline. Uh, you want to check out where the tree is planted. What's the, what's the sun exposure? Uh, does it get too much shade? What's the drainage? Uh, is it irrigated or unirrigated? How's the soil? Uh, is it compacted? Is it too loose? Is it sandy? Is it clay? Things like that. Are other species exhibiting symptoms? So you can see a, a lot of this stuff may not, you know, I may not be looking at the tree to figure out what's wrong with the tree. I'm going to be looking at things that are going on around it. Uh, these, these bullet points I took right out of the TCIA uh, plant health care handbook, by the way. The site management history, and this is where you talk to the homeowner or the tree owner. You ask the right questions. What, you know, they've been on that property every day, you have it. And so ask them, hey, when, when was your pool built? When did this uh, sidewalk get redone? Uh, have you done, has people been out here spraying the yard with chemicals? Uh, do you have those records? Just gathering as much information as you can. Uh, and this can be a tricky part. Whenever you get called out for a diagnosis, it's not uncommon for the tree owner to be present. And you, you get out of your truck and you walk up to the door and it's like immediately, hey, what's wrong with my tree? You haven't even had a chance to, to look around and they expect you to spit out an answer uh, off the top of your head. And it's, it's not too easy. You want to record your observations, make a list of these things, record your observations. That's where you're going to come up with your diagnosis. And then from that diagnosis, you can make your recommendations. You want to apply the correct management controls and set the expectations of recovery. You, the tree owner needs to know uh, how that, how you expect that plant to recover. If you start treating a tree that's in real bad decline, you know, the first expectation that I would set is I don't expect this tree to look any better next year. I just want it to hold its own. And if, if it looks the same next year, that's an indication that we're on the right path. I just don't want it to get worse. So setting expectations like that is really, really important, um, especially when dealing with abiotic disorders. Uh, step eight is evaluation. You got to follow up on that tree after the treatments have been applied. So this is kind of uh, in long form and we're recording this webinar. So uh, this can all, you can come back and, and look at these things if you need to in the future. Okay, so the topic of today is abiotic disorders. So first let's distinguish between biotic and abiotic. 
Biotic is caused by a living organism. So insects, fungus, bacteria, when we're talking about plant materials, those are the living organisms that affect trees. In my opinion, diagnosing trees that have a biotic disorder is way easier than trees that have an abiotic disorder most of the time. Uh, with biotic, there is usually uh, signs that you can see. So if you, that uh, the photo that's second from the left, it says rust underneath it. That's on a Brad repair. Uh, I can see that symptom. I know right off the top of my head uh, that that's rust. If I look on the underside of that leaf, I can actually see the rust pustules underneath there. So there's signs and symptoms associated with living things that make it really easy to diagnose. Uh, some examples of biotic pathogens be like oak wilt, uh, pine wilt disease, horned oak gall. You can see that photo in the top right. Those are that's caused by a gall wasp. So those are really easy to diagnose. The symptoms of biotic pathogens are usually isolated to the same species within a local vicinity. Uh, you're going to see physical evidence of that pest or pathogen, and they're going to cause a distinct symptom. And in some cases, uh, you will see a pattern, especially with pathogens. So with oak wilt, in Texas, there is usually an oak wilt center where there will be dead trees and then symptomatic trees uh, extending out uh, from the dead trees. The same can be said with pine wilt. You will usually have a dead pine tree and then trees surrounding it will begin to have symptoms. And so if you can look for these patterns, that's generally an indication that it's a biotic disorder. And so those of you that are new to diagnosing trees, all of this stuff comes with experience. Nothing uh, is, is going to help you more than, than getting experience. And the best way to do that is just to be out there doing it. And if you don't know the answer uh, when you're looking at a tree, you know, don't fake it. Just tell some, whoever you're talking to, tell them you don't know, but you'll get back to them. And that's how I learned in my early years doing this is I remember I'd be coming back with branch sample leaves, you know, I'd cut off large branches from the tree and, and bring them in uh, to my boss's office, just trying to figure out what was going on. And that was, that's how I learned. And it's, there's nothing like uh, on the job training like that. So now abiotic stress, it's caused by non-living factors, drought, nutrients, soil conditions, chemical injury. Symptoms may have a pattern or they may be random. And so that's, that's why these things are much more difficult because there, there's so many things that can be causing a problem and there's no evidence of an insect. There's no evidence of a disease. Uh, it becomes very tricky. The symptoms may affect multiple different species in a local vicinity. They could appear widespread over a given area. Like if you have drought stress, you know, back in 2011, the whole state of Texas was under drought. Um, or it could just be on one specific tree. Maybe a tree has a girdling root. That's an abiotic stress. Everything else on the property, everything else in that neighborhood could look great. And then you have this one tree declining from a girdling root. So it can be very tricky. Uh, there's a pine tree in the bottom of this slide, and that's winter desiccation. That was out in West Texas. A cold front blew through uh, unexpectedly. And so the north side of these evergreens was uh, dried out like that. So all these things, and that's the other thing you have to pay attention to, what side of the tree is the injury on? And that, those, those are all clues that you can pick up on and, and figure out what's going on. So common abiotic agents, low oxygen diffusion rates, dysfunctional root systems, soil pH, landscape chemicals, drought, weather extremes, repeated defoliations, root loss. So if you look at this list, a lot of these things happen underground where you can't see what's going on. And a lot of these are caused by people. And so this image that I, that I have here, I took this photo back in 2014 or 2015 and I wished I would have written down the address of it because I can guarantee you that tree is not there anymore. And we're going to talk specifically about this tree uh, here in a little bit, here in a little bit as we, as we go through the presentation. 
this book is probably one of the best references that you can have when it comes to diagnosing abiotic disorders. I Googled it yesterday, 33 bucks on Amazon. Uh, it is a fantastic guide, beautiful color pictures, lots of examples. They have case studies. If you don't own this book, you need to look it up. It is, uh, it's great. Okay, so Mannion's disease spiral. I want to take you through this a little bit. Uh, I've seen this image before in textbooks and things like that, but it takes a little bit to understand. So you have a healthy tree. That means everything's great. It likes where it's growing. Uh, it's, it's young, it's vigorous, healthy tree. Enter predisposing factors. Predisposing factors uh, may be like the tree's age, uh, just like kind of with COVID, you know, the people that are predisposed are the ones that are elderly or they have a, another underlying condition. So that's what a predisposing factor is. Something that is unrelated to the disease, but it just makes, it kind of weakens that tree to where it is more susceptible. So you have a tree that's predisposed, more susceptible, and then comes the inciting factors. This could be drought, or uh, construction, something like that. That is an inciting factor that actually damages the tree. And then you get to the contributing factors. This is your opportunistic pathogens. This is generally where diagnosis begins to take place. This is generally where you're gonna be called out is when the tree has already been attacked by these opportunistic pests and pathogens like wood borers and different canker diseases. Those are easy to, de to detect, in my opinion. You can find exit holes of wood borers. You can find sawdust from wood borers. I can see canker diseases on the limbs. That's just, that's superficial stuff. When you're diagnosing a tree, you have to work backwards. You gotta figure out what, hey, what was the inciting factor that led to this? And how do we correct that? You know, how do we, how do we back this tree all the way up into a healthy tree? You know, what was the predisposing factor? Has this tree been, been over irrigated for a long time or under irrigated? So here's an example of the disease spiral. Uh, this is a Leland Cypress. This photo was taken at a golf course uh, near Denton, Texas. And so the symptoms that I'm looking at there, that's flag, that's what I call flagging symptoms where you have individual, individual branches throughout the canopy that are turning brown and dying. If you're to poke your head inside of that canopy and look around, you will find these bleeding cankers. So the pathogen that is causing these flagging symptoms is ceridium canker. That ceridium canker is a very common pathogen of Leland cypress, but the predisposing factor in this case is that the soil on this uh, golf course is very shallow is not uncommon in North Texas. We have shallow sh soils here. The inciting factor for this tree is drought stress, which is kind of exacerbated by shallow soils. Then the contributing factor is ceridium canker. So that's how it works through that disease spiral. It was predisposed because of the shallow soil. Then it got hit by drought stress, which is gonna happen basically every year in Texas. And then finally, the contributing factor, ceridium canker, hit the tree and is leading it to die. There are exceptions to, to that uh, disease spiral. Sometimes your predisposing factor is that you are an ash tree and there is EAB, or that you're an elm tree and there's Dutch elm disease, or you're an oak tree and there's oak wilt. So there's different diseases that uh, are, are exceptions to that disease spiral. Uh, they're invasive species and they can just infect trees that it, it, they don't have to be predisposed. Okay, so one of the inciting factors that we just talked about on that Leland Cypress is drought stress. Drought stress is probably the most common inciting factor across the United States. I mentioned 2011 in Texas. And in fact, for, for much of the country, that was just a terrible, terrible year for drought. And that is a life changing event for a lot of trees. Drought really can be impactful to a tree's health. 
especially one that's as severe as it was in 2011, 2012. So drought can actually happen every single day. If any of you garden, you grow peppers or tomatoes, you've seen acute drought deficit. That's whenever you go outside in the afternoon when you get home from work and you look at your plants and they look sad and droopy like this plant here in the picture. That's called acute deficit. So what you do at that point to your garden is you pull the hose out and you water your garden. And when you come back out the next morning, everything looks great like it never happened. If you weren't to water your plants that evening, uh, that acute deficit would get worse and you'd move into chronic deficit. And that's where you, when you start to see the, uh, the browning of the, of the foliage starts to dry out and get real crispy. If you still don't add water to the plants, that's when they're going to start to look really bad. Uh, that chronic deficit will take over the whole plant. You can see in this photo here, that's a Bradford pear at a church near my house. You can look at the turf underneath it. Uh, it's Bermuda grass. It's all turning dormant. The plants around that tree look bad and that Bradford pear is beginning to show its fall colors. It's going to go dormant for the year. Sometimes trees will do that. They'll get too hot, too dry and they'll just check out and say, I'm going dormant, I'm done with this. And the next year they'll leaf out and they'll look fine. Uh, year after year of this will affect the trees though. Trees are autotrophs. They need their foliage to feed themselves. And so if their growing season gets cut short because of drought and the conditions are unfavorable, they are not building up the carbohydrate stores that they need. And so the next year they're gonna come out, they're gonna be a little bit weaker. So that's where that inciting factor is coming into play. Uh, the tree's weaker. Now these opportunistic pathogens and insects can come in uh, when the tree's defenses are down, so to speak, and infect the tree easily. So when you have multiple years of drought stress, uh, something you might look for is bark splitting. Uh, basically the cells in the trees constrict and the bark will literally split open. And so what you might see associated with that is kind of this black ooze, uh, sometimes a way to check. Some people think that might be caused by a, like a bacterial canker, or maybe there's a wood borer underneath there. You can take a chisel and, and chisel underneath that bark and look for those types of things. Uh, but I will normally see this on some lateral branches and that split will be running parallel to the limb. It's not going to be going perpendicular. It's going to be running uh, in line with the branch. So look for those bark splits for that ooze. You'll see branch tip dieback, and then ultimately a tree mortality as it's not able to get carbohydrates. It's not able to, it needs water to survive all, like all living things. And so if this drought stress goes on and on, uh, you see lo lots of dead trees. If any of you are on from California, Think about that, you had severe drought, then what happened, bark beetle outbreak. So you had an inciting factor, and then the contributing factor was the bark beetles. We talk about drought and everybody knows that trees need, living, uh, need water to live, but we don't actually think about what's going on inside the tree, what is actually happening. So with drought stress, you can kind of think of it as a math equation, transpiration, is exceeding water availability. The plant is using more water than it has. But what happens inside is everything, it, it changes up the hormones and the way the tree is functioning on a physiological level. So the tree senses the drought and that triggers a hormone response, a hormone called abscisic acid. So abscisic acid is what's responsible for the opening and closing of the stomates. So what happens when the tree senses that drought stress is abscisic acid is released and it goes up to the to the leaves and it closes the stomates so the tree stops photosynthesizing when photosynthesis stops the tree is no longer producing the proteins the carbohydrates the other hormones and metabolites that it needs to live and it's not uh, producing the volatile compounds that it needs to ward off uh, pathogens and, and uh, pests if water still doesn't get added back to this equation, that's where you're going to start to see those plant cells desiccate. Uh, you'll see the marginal necrosis of the leaf uh, wilting. 
So that's what you see above ground, and that's generally what people are focused on. All of this drought is happening below ground. So what happens? Your soil is drying out. Well, half of that tree is below ground. All of its roots are there. And the roots that are responsible for absorbing water are fine root hairs. So when that soil dries out completely, so do those root hairs. And so there's a lot of root loss associated with severe drought stress. And so what happens is the tree's root system dries out. So then when water finally is added back to the landscape, the tree is not able to absorb it because it's lost all of its absorbing roots. So here's my math equation. Water uptake minus water loss equals plant available water. And it's a lot more complicated than that. This is really um, just to simplify things, make it easy to think about. So drought is occurring when water loss exceeds water uptake, and that's causing a deficit. There are cultural and agronomic practices that can address the water up, uptake side of the equation. Obviously, when people see their, their trees are drought stressed or their landscape is drought stressed, the first thing they do, let's go to the irrigation control box, let's crank up the water. Or if it's an unirrigated site, they're haul, maybe they're hauling water out that tree using soaker hoses, things like that. So those are some of the cultural things you can do. Let's increase the water to the sensitive plants. There are also agronomic solutions. Um, that's where hydrotain comes into play. Uh, a couple of years ago, ArborJet acquired the controlling interest of Ecologel, and they manufacture a product called hydrotain. And what that is, it's a water managing product that actually extends the availability in water, of water in the soil. Really cool stuff. Uh, the active ingredient in hydrotain is a hydroscopic humectant. And what that does is it acts like a magnet for water molecules. And so as these H2O molecules are evaporating out of the soil, hydrotain is there like a magnet attracting those molecules together so they form a droplet. And that extends out the available time that water uh, can be utilized so that water is not being, so not so much of it is being wasted in evaporation. So that's where most people, when it comes to drought stress, that's what most people are thinking about, is that water uptake side of the equation. But what if you could reduce water loss? Shortstop 2SC is a growth regulator. Uh, the active ingredient is paclobutrazole. And so using a growth regulator, it affects the trees on a hormonal level, on a physiological level. There are no other treatments you can apply to a tree uh, that do the same thing as an application of paclobutrazole. So some of the effects you'll see from paclobutrazole is increased production of root hairs, thicker leaf cuticles, more leaf hairs, increased chlorophyll, smaller stomates, smaller leaves, and additional carbohydrate storage. All of these things, all of these benefits are drought resistance mechanisms. So when you think about trees that are drought tolerant in your area, uh, think about their leaf physiology. Uh, for instance, cedar elms and live oaks here in Texas have smaller leaves. They're more drought tolerant than say a red oak is. Live oaks have a thick waxy covering uh, where red oaks are more of a, a thinner leaf. So these different things affect the trees. Uh, trees that are treated with paclobutrazole will actually have an abundance of abscisic acid. It makes them hypersensitive to drought. I mentioned earlier that abscisic acid is responsible for the opening and closing of stomates. And so when you have an abundance of that hormone, the trees are uh, much better at controlling their, their water loss. And also the increased production of root hairs allows that tree to absorb a lot more water than it would otherwise. A very drought tolerant tree in Texas is actually the bald cypress. People know bald cypress because they grow next to ponds, but I've seen them do very, very well in unirrigated areas. And that's because they have a very extensive root system and they're able to access lots and lots of water throughout the ground. So some examples of using paclobutrazol for drought stress. Here's a photo uh, taken in Colorado. This is 2017, the trees were untreated. You can see the leaf scorch symptoms on all the trees down that row. A colleague came in and treated 
uh, every other tree with paclobutrazole. And uh, it may be difficult to see, but essentially the ones that were treated have green foliage and the ones that weren't treated have scorched foliage. And so here's a close up look at that. The other thing about using paclobutrazole is it lasts for three years in most areas. So it's a kind of a long-term management option for drought stress. So this is a soil applied product. A lot of people think about Arborjet and they think about tree injection. Uh, we have been growing our product line and we're going to talk more about that towards the end of this presentation. Uh, but shortstop is a soil applied. It's applied as a basal drench. Uh, lots of benefits to this product. Lots and lots of uses. I feel like growth regulators are probably one of the most underutilized products in an arborist tool belt. Here's a property I was called out to. Emmett, what's wrong with my tree? You know, I get out of the truck and that's what I'm asked. What's wrong with this tree? The landscaper was there. And I'm, you know, you, you get kind of uh, put on the spot and it's not so easy. You have to look around. So we have two ash trees. This is here in Plano, which is just north of Dallas. We've got two ash trees. One is yellow, the other one's green. They're, they're both in the same yard. What's wrong with that tree? So I got my pole pruner out and I, I clipped off one of the, the branches up high so I could get a closer look at it. And I saw all these spots on the leaves and I almost fell into a trap. I saw the spots and I said, oh, it's got a leaf spot disease. That's what's wrong with this tree. Then I looked a little bit closer and I noticed, I was like, well, not all the leaves have spots on them. You see these back here? These are yellow, they don't have any spots. These have spots and they're kind of irregular, whereas these are different shapes. So that's, that's kind of interesting. That's, that's not too uh, consistent with any leaf disease that I know. And then I looked at this branch. I was like, well, this one, these leaves are green. But back here, they're kind of scorching along the margins. So what's wrong with my tree? And so sometimes your diagnosis, sometimes the people may not be too happy with it because it seems too simple. You know, here's an ash tree. It gets Western exposure, which in Texas, that's an important factor to consider. Uh, what what part of the day is this tree getting most sunlight? And if you're getting western exposure in the middle of summer in, in Texas, that's some high heat. So this is western exposure. Uh, the turf grass under these trees was really, really man. It was very tight. It was Bermuda grass, but they kept it mowed short. It was like a golf fairway, uh, really tight. Uh, you can see the shrubs, how manage managed and manicured everything is in here. Uh, and I just think they weren't getting enough water to these trees. There was drip irrigation in these beds for the shrubs, but it's not nearly enough for the trees. And then the lawn irrigation is going to be just enough for the turf grass, especially if you have really healthy turf. It's really going to compete a lot for those, uh, for those resources that the trees need as well. There's also a driveway right behind here, which is limiting the, the amount of water that these trees can get throughout the day. So that was my diagnosis for this tree. It was scorch, is water stress, abiotic stress, abiotic scorch. They need to get more water to the tree, maybe apply a short stop if they want to do things long term. So abiotic leaf scorch can look a lot of different ways and there's several different things that can cause abiotic scorch. It's a very common symptom. But when people see scorched leaves, they automatically think bacterial leaf scorch. People always want to jump on to the easy diagnosis. They want to point their finger at a pathogen. Oh, that's, that's bacterial leaf scorch. Uh, not so fast. Let's, let's put on our detective dendro hat and see what else is going on. So all these photos were sent to me uh, with people asking me, is this bacterial leaf scorch? No, no, and no. Here's another photo that was sent to me. Hey Emmett, all these species have leaf scorch. It's all in this person's backyard. We've got 
red oak, we got cedar oak, we've got live oak, and they all have this marginal scorching. What's going on? What do you think could be the problem? And so I, I get pictures like this all the time. And so you know, that's not enough information for me to make a diagnosis. And so I always fire back, hey, well, what else can you tell me about that site? What can you tell me uh, what's been going on over there? And so when I asked the question, he said, oh, let me check. I'll get back to you. Well, it turns out that their swimming pool had recently been drained onto the trees. And I think it's a pretty safe bet that the pool chemicals is what's to blame on these trees. So here's some more scorch symptoms. So you can see where I'm going with this. Abiotic scorch is not always associated to drought stress. It can be other things. And so that's where you have to, have to be looking. You have to ask the right questions. You have to ask about the irrigation. Uh, you have to ask about things that have been done on the property. Uh, this is in Austin, Texas. And so we had a bunch of young trees, different species of oak. There was uh, red oak, bur oak, Monterey oak all showing these uh, scorch symptoms. And so it's kind of interesting, if you can see on that right-hand photo that the new tip growth is green, uh, but the, the older foliage is scorched. When I was out there with the, with the landscaper, I didn't have a positive diagnosis for him. I looked around, I was asking about applications, what's been done out here. Nothing really hit me as um, something that could cause this. I followed up with them and they actually had somebody test the water quality from the irrigation here and it contained very high amounts of boron. And so this was boron toxicity. Um, since being involved on this property, I've since diagnosed other trees with boron toxicity. Um, and it's just something, once you have that experience, once you see those symptoms and come across uh, a site that is dealing with a particular problem, you start to learn these things. And so, you know, I didn't have an answer then, but I didn't give them a false diagnosis. I told them, I'm not really sure what's going on here. It doesn't look like a disease to me, uh, but is an abiotic related to the irrigation. So that's, that's the detective work you have to do. And sometimes, you know, if you don't know what's happening there, there's, there's nothing wrong with calling somebody else in that may be a bit more experienced and, and getting the right answer for that person. So leaf scorch, as I mentioned earlier, people want to jump onto the pathogen, the bacterial leaf scorch pathogen. So I wanted to show that quickly and how it, how it differs from some of the things we were looking at. So bacterial leaf scorch, uh, you have leaf chlorosis with marginal necrosis, and that's what I'm showing in that green circle. So the leaves are yellow uh, with a green mid vein. We're going to talk about nutrient deficiencies here in a minute. And that is a very common symptom of nutrient deficiencies. This also with ELS, you will have the marginal necrosis. That can happen with nutrient deficiencies too. So they, they're kind of look alike. But What's going to happen with BLS is it can, it's going to be isolated to specific limbs or branches in the canopy. And it's going to be the same tree, the same branches, year after year, every time it starts to get hot. And it's going to begin to progress throughout that canopy. And so that's where asking the right questions comes in, asking the homeowner, how long does a tree look like this? Does this happen every year? And so you can see this tree taken from further back, the whole tree is not chlorotic. It was just isolated to those branches. And so that's, that's a good indication of bacterial leaf scorch. Surprisingly enough, with BLS, you can actually treat with paclobutrazol uh, as a long-term kind of uh, keep the symptoms at bay approach. That paclobutrazol is going to help maintain uh, the tree's it's going to help it not get those scorch symptoms as bad. It's doing absolutely nothing to the bacterial pathogen. It's just helping that tree be more healthy and helping it retain more water so you don't get those scorch leaves nearly as bad. Uh, but with, in this case, you would also want to use Arbor OTC, which is an antibiotic that can be applied. 
Now this is the really fun stuff, the herbicide injury. This is really cool. This is the kind of stuff that you walk on and you, you walk out on these properties and you're just like, what on earth is going on here? And so this was a cool uh, site for me to walk on. This was a few years ago in Kansas City. Uh, one of my good customers up there, they called me up and they said, Emmett, we treated these trees for, for emerald ash borer and it didn't work. I'm, like, I'm thinking, it didn't work. So I asked him, I said, well, how many trees did, did you guys treat for EAB last year? Oh, we must have treated a thousand or more trees for EAB. I said, okay. And so you're telling me there's one site that it didn't work on? Yeah. I said, okay, well, that doesn't make sense. If you've treated thousands of trees for emerald ash borer and there's 12 trees that it didn't work on, how, how does that make sense? So we went out there uh, to this commercial property and we began looking around. And I was looking for a pattern. And I wish I would have taken more photos, but this is the only one that I, that I had. And so what the pattern that I saw here, you know, I'm looking at the symptoms, you have tip dieback, you have some clusters of growth that you can see right over here. So there's some tip dieback, clusters of growth, thin canopy. This tree over here basically looks dead. There is a little bit of growth on it in this area. But the pattern that I saw is that the trees that were close to this brick area had worse symptoms. And then so like this one is close to the bricks and it's close to the turf. And so it was really great. I had one of my distributor reps with me that's very familiar with herbicides. And so we were looking at this and talking about it. And he said, oh, I know exactly what this is. This is herbicide injury from Roundup Extends. It's not the glyphosate and Roundup that did this. It's the Extends portion. So with, with Roundup, they're, they're adding different chemicals uh, to it because glyphosate is actually a slow killing herbicide. And so they've added different active ingredients. And so it's Roundup Extends or, or Roundup Quick Pro. These different actives are in these different formulations. And so Roundup Extends or Roundup Extended Control contains a Mazapir. And so that's what had happened here. We asked about what had been done in the brick, uh, the brick patio area. And basically they had applied that Roundup Extends at a way too high of a rate. The mazapir is active in the soil, the trees picked it up, and there's your herbicide and chemical injury. So you want to look for unusual symptoms. Epinasty, which is twisting and distortion of the, of the twigs. Stunted leaves. You could call some of this stunted, stunted growth. <clears throat> Misshapen leaves. Scorch, dieback. You can see some chlorosis sometimes when it's, uh, when, with herbicide injury. Look for patterns in the landscapes. Are there more than one species that affected? Is the turf managed? And you wanna ask about the other applications. If you suspect that it's herbicide injury, you've gotta ask about these applications. You've gotta get some evidence about what's been applied. And it's also very tricky because basically you're, you're putting the blame onto another person or another company. And so something like this could have legal ramifications. You know, if, if the property owner here wants to sue that other company for killing their trees, you know, you could be involved in that litigation as a witness. And so sometimes things like this can escalate pretty quickly. And if that is outside of your comfort zone, <clears throat> that's when you can call in a consulting arborist that may specialize in these types of things. And so it's really good to be connected with, with some people like that. I know there's a few in the state of Texas that are uh, expert witnesses and they specialize in this stuff. They write up these expert reports and, and do this stuff all day long. And so it's good to, to be involved with some of those people. This is a site that I was called out to in Houston, Texas. Uh, again, one of those things like what on earth is going on here? Why is that Chinese pistache in the foreground completely dead? And there's a river birch right behind it that's completely dead. And then there's some bald cypress that look great. So look for patterns in the landscape. What did I see? Okay, so I have two species that are affected, two that are not. What's the turf grass look like? 
wow, all the turf grass underneath the trees is dead. <laughs> and so I asked the homeowner, what's going on out here? And she said that a lawn care company uh, applied a tree feed to the trees. And the next thing they know, this is what happened. And so this was some type of a chemical injury. Maybe they just put down some high urea fertilizer that caused fertilizer burn and killed these trees. It also killed the turf. I mentioned bald cypress have a very extensive root system. They're a very hardy tree. So they appear to be unaffected by whatever was put down. All right. If any of you saw my LinkedIn post yesterday, I put uh, a picture or a handful of pictures of some trees showing some unique symptoms. I said it was a pop quiz and I'd reveal the answer today. And that's what we're getting to. So another herbicide. This one's becoming more and more popular. It's called metsulfuron methyl, MSM. It's a systemic broadleaf herbicide with foliar and soil activity. It inhibits cell division and shoots and roots. It is long lasting uh, residual soil activity. In some agricultural practices, uh, there are certain species you cannot plant back onto ground that's been treated with this uh, for like two years because it'll kill the seedlings. Trees are more resilient than seedling crops. You know, it's a larger organism. It's going to take a lot more herbicide to kill it. But basically, trees are broadleaf weeds. They're going to be affected just like the dandelions that these uh, lawn care people are trying to control. And so in this photo, you can see what looks like dieback to the tree. You can see a bunch of interior growth. And you can see the parking lot islands are completely weed free. When you get up closer and zoom in, you can see that that tree does have live buds on it. They just didn't pop. They didn't, they didn't uh, leaf out. You can also see some, some new leaves that are starting to come on. There's some little stuff happening right in here. But these buds, they just didn't come out. And so I pulled down the branch and I scratched it called the scratch test and you can look and see if this tissue is green or if it's brown. So basically if you scratch this and it's you see some green tissue in there, the green is chlorophyll which means that tip is still alive. So these buds are still active, they just hadn't popped yet. That's really weird because it's at the end of April in Texas and red oak should have already completely leafed out. And so it looks like dieback but the tips are still alive. One of the trees I saw had kind of this uh, chlorosis look to it and the leaves are a little bit curled up. Some of the leaves are abnormally large. What happens is these trees are trying to compensate. You know, it doesn't have all the leaf area that it wants to feed itself. And so it begins trying to compensate its leaf area index. And so some of the leaves, like if they're supposed to be the size of your hand, I mean, they'll, they'll get double, double that uh, just really deformed looking. And so here's, here's another shot on that same property. You can see the branch tip dieback is pretty severe on this tree, or it's not dieback. Uh, eventually, the trees will metabolize that MSM and come out of it. So I may follow up on these trees. It's at a little shopping center not too far from me. I'll follow up on these. I imagine by August or September, they'll probably have leafed out. But year after year, applications of this MSM is going to be detrimental to these trees. And especially because it's a root inhibitor as well, so you're affecting the root system and then also that tree is not able to uh, get the food that it needs. So that's kind of your inciting factor, which may lead the trees to getting wood borers and other pathogens and ultimately killing the trees. All right, this is the last one I have on herbicides, I believe. Applicator asked me to go look at these pine trees. He thought it had pine tip moth because all the tips were brown, which is a good first guess. I went out there, I started breaking the tips off looking for larval galleries from the pine tip moth. Like I said, with insects or biotic organisms, 
I think those are easy because I can find evidence of that critter or of that, of that pathogen. And so it's like, I think it's pine tit moth. Go see what you think. And so I went and was looking at that. I didn't find any. Uh, what I did start looking around at, I said, okay, so all the tips are brown. The interior looks fine. What could be going on here? And I noticed that there'd been a lot of weed control done underneath these trees. And so it was whatever weed control agent uh, had been applied to, you know, to make that bare ground, maybe that roundup extends. I wasn't able to meet with anybody on, anybody on that property, but that's what, I, that's what I diagnosed it as. Okay, moving on from herbicide injury, we're gonna talk a little bit about chlorosis. This is a topic that's near and dear to my heart. It goes back to my agronomy roots and, and soil management applying fertilizers and things like that. Uh, I love treating chlorotic trees because you can get really great results really fast. Uh, I just, I've always thought it's fun. That's, that's what kind of tree nerd I am. So when we talk about chlorosis, we have to talk about the soil pH. So the pH, if you can do one type of soil test or look at one thing and understand one thing about a soil test, look at the pH. That's going to dictate all the different nutrients that are available in the soil. I just saw how long I've been talking and we are going, it's a lot of, a lot of stuff to cover in here. If I do go over guys, I, because I'm doing this as a post approval CEU, if I do go over an hour, I will extend that time. And so uh, get you an extra quarter CEU or half CEU. Hopefully I don't go over the too, too bad though. So you're looking at the pH and I highlighted pH of eight. That's pretty common in the Western United States. And what happens when you get to that high of a pH is your micronutrients begin to get bound up to the soil particles. Iron, manganese, copper, boron, and zinc are all limited when you get to higher pHs. There is a agronomic principle, it's called the law of minimum. And basically what that is saying is that your yield, when it's referred to cropping, uh, I'm gonna call it health as we regard trees, your health is limited by a greatest limiting factor. And in some cases that could be iron. Where most, most chlorotic trees, people say it's an iron deficiency. And so maybe iron is your greatest limiting factor. And so that is as healthy as your tree can be is just the limited amount of iron that, it's get, that it gets. And so what this law goes on to state is that if you supply that greatest limiting factor, it's only going to improve the health of that plant to the next limiting nutrient or next limiting factor. So say you apply a bunch of iron to a tree, that's gonna green it up maybe for a short period of time because the tree is also deficient in manganese. And so you're just gonna correct the iron deficiency and the next thing that you're gonna see is a manganese deficiency because you didn't address that as well. Other things that it can, can affect the tree's health are the site conditions or the growing conditions. And if you look back here on the, the back side of this bucket, the soil conditions and other growth factors. This is important because it plays into these, these next set of slides that I have here. This is a site that I was doing some research on for our MinJet FE product. You can see these trees are all severely chlorotic. Whenever I'm looking at chlorotic trees, I grade them as light, moderate, or severe. These are definitely severe. So you can see they're in very poor health. Uh, they got their first application in November of 2016. And that's what they look like in July of 17. And I was actually kind of disappointed with the results here. I gave them the high dosage of uh, Minjet and I thought they would just look awesome. I was really pretty bummed out when I pulled back into the parking lot. But it got me thinking about that law of minimum. And I said, well, wait a minute. These trees are in a parking lot and they were severely chlorotic, so they've been in poor health for a very long time. And so basically what I'm getting at is there's a lot of other stuff going on with these trees besides just the chlorosis. There was other, it was further down that spiral than just being chlorotic. And so 
I didn't do anything to them in 2018, or I didn't get a picture of them in 2018, but I did treat them again in the fall of 2018. So they got two rounds of Minjet FE, two years apart, and then that's what the trees were looking like last year in June. And so they actually look like trees again, you know, compared to the untreated check. And so you can just see in what type of shape they were when I started by looking at that untreated check tree. You know, it's got branches that are dead. It's got tip dieback. It's in really poor health. And so now just, just two rounds of micronutrients. That's the only thing I've done out there. And those in that parking lot island are, are recovering nicely. This is a tree that's in an O'Reilly's parking lot near my home. Uh, it gets no irrigation. It gets full sun exposure. It's planted in probably some of the worst dirt you can think of. And then it has people dumping antifreeze and power steering fluid on it uh, every time they, they're working on their cars out there in the parking lot. I started on this tree back in 2015, uh, just applying our Minjet FE product. That's what it looked like the next summer. You can see the branch tip die back, so that tree was in poor health. That's what it looked like in June of 17. Here it is in June of 18. So I treated it in 15 and I got green growth in 16, 17, and 18. So three years of green up from that one application. In the fall of 18, because it was reverting back to its chlorotic state, I treated it again with Minjet FE with the high rate and then with short stop 2SC, the growth regulator that I mentioned earlier. And that's what it was looking like in June of 2019. I thought it looked tremendous for the site that it's on, how stressful of a condition this tree is growing in, and the state that it was when I started on this tree back in 15. Uh, what it was looking like, I was blown away. And I actually drove by it the other day, and it is it's the best looking tree in that parking lot, even though it's in the worst site. That just goes to show what correcting some of those nutrient deficiencies and then also using the short stop can do for the health of a tree. When you're treating for chlorosis, I uh, just want to kind of lay out the cost that you're going to incur here. With the high rate of Minjet FE, you're looking at a, about $1.73 per inch. Using an arbor plug, you're going to add a quarter onto that, so $2 an inch. If you were to do the Cadillac treatment and do short stop as well, uh, you're looking about $3.35 an inch for that Cadillac treatment of chlorosis, uh, which should last about three years. Your best results are going to come with fall applications or early in the spring before the trees leaf out. If you get called out to the site uh, after the fact, like right now, uh, as we're going in the growing season, you can use the, the low rate, but just make sure that the leaves have hardened off. If you treat too early, you can cause fertilizer burn to the, to the canopy. And then you also want to wrap up those injections by mid-July. Uh, as you move into the hotter, drier parts of the year, you can also cause some phytotoxicity from, it's basically fertilizer burn. So that's why I really like the fall applications. These are treatments you can sell during the growing season. Hey, right now is not the best time to do this. Let's push it off until fall. We can treat it in November, December. And that's a way for you to extend out your revenue earning periods. You also have to be careful with some of the species. Uh, maples and pears are susceptible to phytotoxicity more so than oaks are. Make sure you clean your equipment after you use Minjet FE. It's corrosive. It's essentially liquid metals and there are metal components in your equipment and it will corrode them and break them. I've learned from experience. All right, I have a handful of slides left. I know I'm, I'm pushing an hour here. Uh, this is the really good stuff. We're gonna talk about construction syndrome here in a minute, which is the most common uh, tree killer in the DFW area and actually much of the United States. And so back to my disease spiral, my disease spiral predisposing and inciting factors. So people predispose trees to death as soon as they plant them because they plant the wrong species or they put it in the wrong location or they plant it too deep. 
where they make it into a mulch volcano. So as soon as somebody sticks a tree in the ground and they've done it incorrectly or put it in the wrong spot, they're setting that tree up for failure. Irrigation practices are also a, a predisposing factor for why trees don't thrive in landscapes. They either have too much or not enough. Then you move on to your inciting factors. Construction stress, that's a big one. Uh, soil disturbances, fills and cuts, the way people care for that tree, improper pruning, be it topping or lines, tailing, or just over pruning it in general. I've seen a tree die because it was pruned too much. A big red oak like this one in the photo, uh, they pruned too much out of the canopy. And so the sun was able to penetrate to the main stem and cause sun scald on the main stem of the trunk. It was a big tree and it began dying because of that. So be careful, don't over prune trees, don't top trees. Uh, make sure you attend some pruning seminars and, and learn the correct way to prune trees. And then the turf herbicides, these are inciting factors. We talked about MSM, uh, atrazine, dicamba, 2,4-D, those are some other ones that can affect trees as well as like that Roundup Extends that I talked about. Proper planting. I, when I have an audience in the room, I'll show people these, these next couple of slides, slides and I'll get laughs. Uh, I hope you're laughing at home. This is at uh, the Dallas Cowboys practice facility. I went around looking at the trees for another reason and underneath all of them were these, I think it's called like a root anchor. I think by the manufacturer specifications, it's supposed to be removed after the first growing season. As you can see, this was not been there for a couple of years uh, with no intentions of being removed. And so as that tree grows, it's just going to get girdled by that rebar that's left in the ground. This is a, another anchoring system. It's called uh, Arbor Stakes. I'm not affiliated with them. I just saw them at a trade show. It's really cool. This was designed by a landscape architect who's also a certified arborist. It's essentially like a, it's a dowel rod that's been sharpened like a pencil on one end. And so it works really well on BNB trees. You can basically nail that root ball to the ground. This plastic thing, this is a, it's a plastic made out of a biodegradable resin. And so you slip that over the top of the dowel rod. And then with the handsaw, you saw off the tops of these dowel rods. And so everything's biodegradable. There's no tripping hazards. Uh, there's nothing that's gonna girdle the tree in the future. It's a really cool device. I thought it was a, a, great, uh, a great way to plant trees. And I'm not sure it's gonna work in every situation. I mentioned earlier, we have very shallow soils. May not work in shallow soils. May not work on uh, containerized trees because of the media that they're growing in, but it's still a really cool way and uh, just showing you there's different ways to do things. Mulch volcanoes. This has become the norm. Why? I wish I could get in front of an audience that actually plants trees. Many arborists that that's who I'm usually giving my talks to don't plant trees. It's landscapers that do. How do we get this information? How do we change the way that people are doing this? Because all these trees are set up for failure. You need to see that root flare. Because what happens when you don't, when you're not able to see the root flare is you're gonna end up with girdling roots. And if you don't address those girdling roots when the tree is young, you're gonna have to address them when the tree is big. A lot of times these don't get addressed and you'll just see the trees lodged over after a thunderstorm because that root, the root wins. So it's going to girdle into that stem and choke the tree off. Uh, think about species in, that you're familiar with that have girdling roots. Uh, red maple is one that, that comes to mind. Chinese pistache has problems with girdling roots. That's generally where I start my diagnostic approach. If I can't see the root flare, I'm going to sell a root flare excavation. I want to see that. I want to check for girdling roots. I want to plant, uh, check for uh, those root anchors. I want to look for straps that may be down there or a wire basket. All sorts of goofy stuff gets left in the planting hole. So back to the construction stress. 
So if we had a healthy tree at, on this side at one point in time, it is now predisposed because this tree is probably uh, 80 years old. So it's getting old. Now the inciting factor is that they literally built a house on top of it. And so by the time all this construction is done, we're going to be at these contributing factor stage. Like I said, that's when you generally get called out. So the best management practices avoid predisposition. And that's what this photo is of me right here. That's my favorite tree in the whole world. That's on my family's farm in Hondo, Texas. It's in a creek next to, next to uh, my parents' house. It's made it. That tree, there's no telling how old that tree is. Several hundred years old. Uh, it's made it. It avoided predisposition. It has not had any inciting factors. There are no contributing factors to uh, suppress. So that tree is, is good to go. But these are your best management practices when you do come into contact like with that construction property. So suppress the contributing factors, salvage what you can, set and manage expectations. So an example, what would I do if I were called out to this property uh, by the homeowner or maybe the builder called me out uh, for a site evaluation? Save this tree. The first step I would do here is a tree risk assessment. Is that tree even worth saving? Don't come up with a management plan if you, the first thing you look at is a buttress root that's next to the house has been severed. All right, that's a liability. So do your tree risk assessment. You know, this tree has uh, two leads. Looks like this one on the left hand side. If something were to fail, maybe this lead would fall right into somebody's bedroom. So maybe this tree is not even worth saving. Next is to set and manage expectations. Hello, Mr. Homeowner. You built a house on top of your tree. There was a lot of soil disturbance and stuff dumped onto your tree. Uh, the soil around here looks really bad. Uh, if you want me to save this tree, it's going to be a long-term process. I don't expect your tree to look good for at least five years. You know, don't, don't set the bar too high because uh, if you, if you, <laughs> If you set the bar low and you beat those expectations, you're looking really good. And I'm not trying to be unethical when I say that, but you just don't know. There are no guarantees when you're, when you're treating a tree like this. Now, the first step I would take in terms of treatment would be to prevent the opportunistic pests and diseases. Those are very easy things to do. I can inject the tree with triage, which I know is super effective against wood boring insects for two years. So I'm going to prevent those opportunistic tree killers for at least two years from that one treatment. And since I'm injecting the tree, I may as well go ahead and apply phosphojet, which is a potassium phosphite. That's going to help ward off those opportunistic pathogens like hypoxylin canker. Next thing I'm going to do is I want to loosen up that soil. I want to get the air spade in there, do, try to do some soil decompaction, radial trenching, something to get some oxygen down into that soil. On that same trip, I'm going to apply something to encourage the roots in the soil microbiology. You can imagine after all of this has been going on, the health of that soil is really low. And that's the bacteria, the mycorrhizae, all the living organisms that are in the soil have been impacted by all this construction. So you want to apply carbon sources like molasses, humic acid, biochar, compost, seaweed extract, things like that to encourage uh, the soil health and root health. I'm thinking about carbon sources way before I'm thinking about nutrition. Large trees, in my opinion, they don't need a lot of NPK. That can boost the vitality and it may be uh, appropriate in some situations. Uh, it just depends on what that situation is. But I always think you need to be using different types of carbon um, and not just sticking to one source. I like to mix it up. If you use molasses, that's like a fast release carbon. Humic acid is an extended release carbon, and then biochar is even more extended release. It lasts forever. And so mix these things up. They're all beneficial to the soil. In some cases, I might apply short stop uh, to these trees, but only if I, deem, if I think that tree is in good enough health to warrant that treatment. And what I mean by that, if that tree is in really severe decline, if it's not growing at all, I do not want to put a growth regulator on it right then and there. I want to do some other things to boost that tree's vitality, start to see some tip growth, 
and then apply the short stop. I want to make sure that tree can handle that, that application. After I do my treatments, I'm going to monitor that tree for health and new growth. Like I said, uh, look at the bud scars for the trees. Look at the wound closure. Look for, look, here's a pruning cut right here. You want to look at that bark and see if it closes over that wound anymore. Uh, look, for, look for those signs of vitality in the tree. Then you're going to continue on with those treatments until healthy. Last, last few slides here, guys. I'm, I know I've gone over, but uh, just a, a big topic to cover with all this stuff. The Tulsa Zoo was doing a construction project. Uh, they reached out to me for some, for some help. Lots of oak trees around this playground that, they, that was being installed. And unfortunately, they didn't do any type of uh, tree protection going into that project. And so I got called onto the site. This is uh, earlier this year. You can see what's going on. You can see all these, these roots that are exposed. I think this is a uh, swamp white oak. These oaks in this left photo are about uh, 43, 45 inches in diameter. You can see they've got like a road right here where they've been driving. They built these structures. So just very, very compacted soils all around these trees. Nothing was done uh, to protect them. The trees are predisposed because they're old. They probably weren't in great health to begin with. And then your inciting factor is the construction. So the next thing that's going to happen is contributing factors, insects and disease. So what is my management approach? What would I do? And so I actually laid out a program for them. Uh, so I got out there in January. I recommended an application of short stop. I felt those trees would be in good enough health. Uh, that short stop would be a very good product to put down because of all the good things it's going to do for those trees. So that did get done. Uh, March and April, I recommended that they have hire a contractor to come in with an air spade and do some of soil amending and apply the zoo's compost because believe it or not, the zoo had some very good compost supplies from all the, the good animal poop that they collect out there. Also at that time, I recommended they trunk inject with triage and phosphojet, just like I showed you on that last slide. Fortunately, we haven't been able to do this because of COVID, I haven't been able to get back down there or up there to do that. We can still get to those treatments though. Uh, the next thing I recommended was in this coming June to apply hydrotain and cytogrow. Those are some great products that will extend the availability of water and increase the tree's root mass. So to help them through the stressful summer after all this construction has been going on. July, August, September, the hottest months of the year, Go ahead and get a thorough irrigation to those trees one time per week. This fall, go ahead and do a bark spray with agrifos and pentrobark. Agrifos is a potassium phosphite, just like phosphojet. Those fungicides are very good at eliciting a plant health response. And in my experience, keeping a constant level of those active ingredients in the tree really goes a long way to improving tree health and warding off those opportunistic diseases. Also in the fall, I want them to root drench with BioMP, Enviroplex, and Cytogrove. These are all products that are part of our Arbor RX product line. Uh, this is molasses-based product, Enviroplex is humic acid-based, and the Cytogrove is seaweed extract. So all of those things are going to be beneficial to the root system and to the microorganisms in the soil. I laid out a four-year program for them. And so back in 2021, we're going to come back with that bark spray. Uh, we're going to do another root feeding with those same products. In the summer, we're going to do the same thing with hydrotain and cytogrow. And then uh, we're going to water throughout the summer. And then in that, the next fall, we're going to do the same thing, the bark spray and the root feed. So you can see what I'm talking about, laying out a plan and following through with that. It's really important. Set those expectations. Uh, real quick, this is, i got two more slides. Uh, Arborflex is a 1445 fertilizer, 50% slow release nitrogen, does have micronutrients as well. BioMP, Enviroplex, Cytogrow, these are the ones that I'm talking about. These are fantastic products for encouraging root development and also uh, soil health. We talked about hydrotain, uh, extending the availability of water in the soil, and that's a 
basically all of those combined together equal Nutra root, uh, which contains the hydrotain technology. And this is a fantastic product if you're planting trees uh, for their survival. So in summary, I know I've been talking a long time, guys. I feel it too. Summary, tree decline is often triggered by an abiotic stress. The early identification and correction of those abiotic factors, you can reverse tree decline. But you need to develop and utilize a diagnostic process. So if you are a tree care company watching this, rewind it, go back to those first slides that I showed, write down that diagnostic process. Uh, years ago, I think I saw a diagnosis worksheet. And if somebody has that, if you could send it to me, that'd be awesome. It might be something I just have to, to make on my own, but a worksheet, kind of like a checklist. You just check off the boxes. Uh, what's the root flare look like? You just got to go through and analyze all these different factors about that site and about the tree. So develop that process and stick to it. Ask the right questions. Understand that not every tree is going to be savable. And I think this is a, this is a hurdle for some arborists. Uh, you want to save every tree. We're, we all love trees. And so you got to know when to walk away. If that tree has a root that's been, a large root that's been cut or you see decay, something going on there, do that risk assessment, walk away if you need to. IPM, integrated pest management, involves more than just pesticides. So it's kind of a holistic approach. Get the soil healthy and more than likely you're gonna have a healthy tree. Really important is to set and manage expectations. I cannot make that point enough. I think it's probably the third or fourth time I said it this presentation. Set and manage the expectations. Get that tree owner on the same page as you. They are with that tree every day. They're looking at it every day. They need to know what to expect because if you treat that tree today, they may expect it to look better tomorrow or next week. You got to tell them what to expect. And if you don't, you're going to set yourself up for fail failure. Lastly, create a plan and follow through with it. Thank you very much for your attention today. Sorry, I went over about 20 minutes. I know it was a lot of information. It's a very big topic uh, about diagnosing and, and managing things. I'm, I'm sorry that I, it took so long. Thank you for being here. Um, if y'all want to stick around for questions, I know it's Friday afternoon, so I probably should have done this uh, earlier in the day. Uh, I apologize for that. Let's let's go ahead and do some questions. All right. 